Next, we've got a video with uh, Angelo back from um, Awake and Why. Um, he sits down or has a little interview, um, a little interview with Dover Street Market doing during their Dover Street, Lon- Dover Street Market London, I think, a uh, pop up that they did recently. Um, Angelo is a former, what is it, brand director at Supreme, actually. Yeah, um, back in the day, if you're familiar with him. Um, again, he was around during the heady days of Supreme, you know, the good old days, back in my day, and left and kind of, you know, took a big jump, man, took a big leap at the time. I remember seeing that news and being like, whoa, okay, I'm surprised that he left, right? Because, you know, being a brand director and being, being what he did, I don't know, his role and maybe a Brendan Babjian role kind of differs in the idea of like, you know, you could understand why Brendan would leave. Maybe he kind of felt like he outgrew Supreme, right? He kind of didn't want to keep making clothes for 21-year-olds. He sort of wanted to make his own stuff and he couldn't necessarily make that under the Supreme umbrella because it wasn't maybe stuff that they could maybe sell to their core demographic so there might be a point of like you know artistic expression where you kind of get frustrated and you want to make your own thing right but for someone like uh angela back to leave he's kind of quite comfortable position as a brand director right um someone that kind of sits behind the scenes that is kind of having an opinion on all different things whether it's styling whether it's photography whether it's overall brand direction and brand building he's very uh, much so um how do you say he had a, he had a very cushy job he didn't need to leave, right? So for him to kind of take that step and kind of leave on that regard is a big, big, big thing. And I think he kind of mentions a little bit of it in his video. We can watch here. Again, I'll link it to show notes for you guys that are listening via podcast. But let's get something from the high snob. Pretty good video, actually. I like this girl too that interviews people. She's really cool. She seems very warm and personable. <laughs> Street market. Now the reason we're here is to meet Angelo back, talk about his latest collection and his exclusives for DSF. Let's move on a little bit here. Signing t-shirts and that, nice. How are you feeling? Um, I feel good. Yeah. Yeah, I feel good. Life is good. I accept something. Got to love Americans, innit? It, it, only, only they can wear glasses indoors. Have you tried wearing glasses indoors before? I tried, right? I tried. I really did try. Um, I saw Solomon DJing once, um, and I saw him. Of course, he's famous for wearing his sunglasses right behind the decks, and it looks really cool. But Jesus Christ, it's difficult to keep, you know, your composure. The headphone thing kind of squints your glasses, does that. It kind of makes it pop out sometimes. You look a bit dumb, but you know, it just, I don't know. America just look cooler wearing glasses. Just have a way of wearing it without it looking douchey. In the UK, it's just something you just can't do. And I guess you know, I don't know. Wish I could wear glasses indoors. That's pretty cool though. Again, this is it speaks to the legacy of Supreme in it that so many of their ex employees, so many of their overall crew have gone on to do so many amazing things. It just goes to shows it just shows the level again, most of it is probably due to the fact that they're so picky of who they kind of invite into their inner circle, right? I think because of that, they get to choose from the best of the best. The people that are going into that circle are, you know, the best performers within their little niche. They're obviously appreciative of the brand association. And they also want to prove, show and prove, right? Um, you don't want to be the the kind of, you know, the dead guy in the group. So there is that part of it, but it is really, really unprecedented just how many stellar uh, brand builders, um, creatives, um, cultural figures that have kind of spawned from that Supreme family. It's really, really weird. It's fucking bizarre. Of course, most of it has to do with, you know, the, the, all the good work James did in building that brand and making it so covetable and making it so desirable and making it a destination having that stamp, having that box logo in your chest does something to it, empowers you, makes you feel bigger, right? At a time when I was wearing Supreme, and that's what it did to me. So I guess everyone that kind of goes into that space wants to also do that, wants to kind of somehow replicate that overall feeling and vibe in the thing that they do. And, you know, it's no coincidence that Awake has a brand logo that sticks right in the middle. It's a particular font. It's very unique. You can spot it from a mile off. Same with Noah, right? Um, same with the New York thing when that was around. Same with Keith, half an egg with half 
there's so many of those kind of brands that you can just spot from a mile away just the logo along it evokes a certain kind of feeling and it's no again no coincidence that they come from supreme and they've kind of replicated that in their own lane you can tell just speaking to you it's a big deal and i think the one thing is is that what's so inspiring about what you do is that you really want to mentor kids as well or give them advice on what the younger you would do so what would the younger you do in today's society that's a big um that's a good question because uh, when people ask me like what I would do differently, I really I wouldn't change the trajectory of my career like life path because I feel like everything happened for a reason. Yeah. So I wouldn't want like I wouldn't want what's happening to me now to happen to the twenty one year old version of me because yeah. I probably would have fucked up. Yeah. And not really appreciated it. I, I like that I had a, like each level in career like it just got harder and harder. It yeah. never got easier. Yeah. Um, which again is a very good point, right? Something that you don't, something that you you don't really hear often in the kind of you know success stories, because there is a bit of pushback online I've seen with people sharing their success stories and saying you can do it too, because there is a little bit of a um, survivor's bias, right? Because you're only hearing from the people that have actually done well, right? You're not hearing keep going and chasing after dreams from the people that haven't done well because why would they say that they failed at their dreams right they're having to resort back to working a normal job and there are stories like that that exist right but i think what is i think the differentiator for me in my experience would be that it's how you frame success what does success mean to you right and i think i could generally sit here and say that i just want to have the journey i want to be able to look back on my life and say that i try to do certain things i try to be a dj i try to have my own brand i try to be a consultant i try to make art i try to take pictures i try to be a cultural figure i want to try these things right in order for me just to kind of do them right because the journey is fun right because you know again we live in this we live in an age where there's not many subcultures right in general for the most part apart from the things that you're interested in so life is a bit mundane as is right you wake up in the morning you get to go to work you you know clock in clock out you have a the same group of friends for the most part if you live in a certain area or you work in a certain in a certain field your friends don't change that often and that's what you have that's your world there's nothing else there so the only thing that you can do is pick up interest along the way right pick up a hobby pick up a passion project and kind of dive on deep and see where it takes you and that to me is a success it's not necessarily the can you win the Turner Prize? Um, can you get your book published? Is your brand going to sell out in 10 minutes? That isn't a success. The success is just doing it, right? The success partly is like, I remember even for me when I used to make t-shirts, it's, it's you the feeling of like taking that PSD file and somehow turning it into a physical item is you can't buy that, right? You can't buy that feeling of like, wow, I was making this on my bed, right? Uh, at four in the morning and somehow I've turned it into an actual t-shirt or a hoodie. And now all of a sudden I'm selling. And even if you don't sell one, just the idea that you have a shop link on your website is just amazing, right? The idea that you actually have your own store that you're you're selling things on or you're selling for Instagram. That is that is the the win alone. So I guess sometimes when people complain about the survivor's guilt thing, oh, you're only hearing from people that have actually done success. Cool. But also, I think the conversation of success is just, it's just always about the end goal. It's about having yourself in Dover Street, which is not really the game. The game is like, you know, um, Angela was in Supreme, probably feeling unfulfilled, probably feeling like he'd done he done the most he could do in the role. He kind of, you know, uh, done everything he could do, sorry, in the role, and he wanted a new, fresh challenge. And he's always wanted to have to have his own brand. If you know him from the Nom de Guerre days, it was kind of, you know, um, he's kind of come from a very uh, rich history. Awake has always been something he's kind of had as a passion project on the side. He never really put any time into it because, again, it takes resource, it takes time, it takes money to do. Maybe he wasn't the right point of life to do it. And, he, you know, it's something that you would have gone to your grave regretting that you didn't give a go. And he's doing it. He's just giving it a go. That's the major success. The success isn't the selling out. It's the just having it done. Like, wow, I did it. I can kind of check that off the list and keep it moving. So that's probably the side of it that I would talk about. And again, the second, the other bit that, again, I'm not too sure how to address without sounding cynical is the thing about kids. Because I know growing up when I came through the scene, um, it wasn't easy, man. Like these guys, these older dudes who are still around now didn't make it easy to get involved. They didn't make it easy. They kind of went out of their way to be dicks, really, for the most part, if I'm honest, especially the London guys, right? Um, they weren't the nicest to us to us kids coming up. Again, it might be because of the way we acted. We might have come in a little bit too um, overzealous. We might have maybe not paid our dues, as I was told constantly by some people. 
um, which again is a very odd statement um, considering that you're there and you want to learn right not paying your dues like what is that compared to dues mean what get on my knees and you know sucking you off and shit you're not sure what they actually mean but um, again if you take that as it is maybe that that was aspect of it but I always felt as if like there was an unnecessary level of hurdle jumping to get involved in a scene and then suddenly it changed the generation after us right and mostly because the generation after us are a lot more social media savvy and a lot more social media and a lot more popular on social media, right? They had a lot more of a following. They had a lot more of a, a cult following. That kind of came along the The era of the kind of Ian Connors suddenly changed how everyone approached kids, right? And they suddenly saw them as a monetary value. There was a monetary value being associated with a chat of kids in the scene that were popular, which is, I chart the difference in it from um, for Hideout. There was a period in Hideout where there was just old white guys working in there, right? Um, you see sometimes Fraser pop by. Um, you see uh, another guy, I forgot his name. Um, Andrew Bunny would pop by sometimes, right? A few other people. There was loads of older white guys in Hideout, right? Just working in and chilling out. And a couple of uh, Japanese dudes that are part of the OG Give Me Five crew. Then suddenly it changed and it was full of kids. It was full of just like trendy London kids, right? Who were kind of popular in the scene at the time. And it always kind of irked me at the time. I was like, the fuck? Like, we would love to have worked here at the time, right? And you would, you know, when we walked in there, they'd give us a cold shoulder. No one talked to us. They'd be like, just dicks overall. And then suddenly you go into Slam City and Hideout and it's full of kids. You're like, huh? And you're like, ah, oh, I get it. Because these are the public kids. Fine enough, isn't it? Because we were, again, I think our, my generation was a bit late on social. They were kind of growing social. They grew up with social media. So they got instantly popular really quickly, posting their outfits, just being around town, doing the things that like all kids do. So it kind of felt like to me like some of these brands were associated with children just or with kids in the scene because it was a there was some sort of monetary value in it, but it wasn't a real love for them. They didn't really, you know, they don't want them to take their jobs. They're giving them internships. They just give them free clothes. They don't pay them well. Loads of really weird, snarky things like that. And again, for a kid when you're 18 to 21, you just appreciate to be around, man. You don't care if they don't get paid. You just want to be in and around and soak up game and go and do your own thing. So for you, it's a win-win. But again, I'm not too sure how genuine it is. I, I know for maybe Andrew is a bit different because I, I know he did the make of... No, he, what did he do? Not make a verse. He did something during um, Design design uh, Miami. Is it Art Basel? He did a, a kind of like a school thing. A little... Col- yeah, yeah, a little... A little kind of pop-up educational thing where people came up and spoke about things concerning his concerning streetwear history and kind of gave lessons on how to screen print and make zines. So there is a part of him that's very much about giving back to the kids. That's very organic, I feel like, and a lot of his lookbooks have used loads of kids in the local community that I'm sure he's you know in touch with who are helping out his brand and stuff like that. So he might be genuine, but I just don't know, man. Whether I feel like that kids thing is a real appreciative thing. Like when Virgil keeps talking about kids and stuff, I don't know if that's a thing or if that's just because you know again they're the hot the kids are the hot thing on the scene right they're the ones that can shift your product you get bari you get some of these kids to wear your shit and it's gonna sell out right you know i don't know i don't know i don't know and like now being a business owner multiple businesses like it's really fucking hard yeah. so yeah <laughs> Oh, sorry, and that's what I'm talking about. It never gets easy. That's true. I've known it from my DJing stuff. It never gets easier. You think the more you do something, the big, the more bookings you have, you suddenly get into autopilot. Never happens because what happens when you get into that scene? You want to show improve. You want to show you're better than people that are on there. You want to get further and further and further. You want to differentiate yourself from everybody else. What you do? You invest more time in getting better. Getting more, getting better means that you take some more time. There's more at stake. It just gets more difficult. It never gets easy. It never, especially if you got high standards for yourself. If you if you not got high standards, you just want to coast by. Then fair enough, you can do it. But if you got high standards, it's never gonna get easier. Well, I, what I would do, to, I wouldn't do anything different. You know, I would hope that I would be wise enough today at twenty one to still get an internship and learn from others and not uh, let my like ego get in the way. You know. What makes you happy? Yeah, it's true. Again, I did an internship and it really was beneficial to me. I worked at uh, Twelve Bar a really um, well-known, at the time, well-known London streetwear brand. They were kind of probably the first, you know, popular London streetwear brand to kind of go over seas and do that sort of malarkey. And that was really fun. It really taught me a lot. I got to meet loads of interesting people. I got to see the inner workings of the scene. I got to see that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as crazy or hard as I thought it was, right? It was just something I could do myself. It's just two guys running a brand like everyone else was, right? So it kind of, you know, takes away the mystique about it. You get to see the inner workings of it. You get to see how difficult it is. And, you know, you get to do so many things. I got to send posts. I got to photocopy things. I got to help out with design. I got to chip in with maybe building a website. I got to touch 
so many areas of the actual company that again when you once you leave you get a real hunger to do and start your own thing or to maybe see where you fall in the or maybe just get to see where you fall in the scene you might be an operator you might be a brand builder you might be a facilitator you might be a strategist but that only will experience can come from an internship and again i think nowadays especially if you're a kid and you don't want to go to university you don't want to waste money on the fees and stuff it probably is advantageous if you're going to spend a three years at home just to intern intern for loads of brands intern for an accessory brand intern for i don't know people like places and faces and stuff and all those kind of people and just you know just hang around soak up game help them out like bring value don't try and extract value don't take any money at all maybe even travel money don't take nothing um bring bring a pat lunch and just soak up game as much as you can and kind of apply it to your own career and that you definitely go further in that one i think in my in my i think that's probably the best to do as opposed to maybe going out and putting out your voice straight away you know being so quick to say what you want to say and kind of put your name on something that might be a bad way to go about things because you, you know you want to make a good impression the first time you don't want to put up subpar product because you know it's hard to kind of come back from that so maybe taking some time to hone your craft you know, in in the trenches, behind the scenes, it may be a good way to go about things. But yeah, I recommend you check it out. Really good interview. Angela Back, it's on Heisner Bio. I'll link in the show notes for you to check out and you can see.